This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA, sharing ideas, shaping policy. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our IIEA webinar on digital technologies and the mental health of adolescents. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA and I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Amy, Amy Orban, who's a psychologist, a fellow of St. John's College at the University of Cambridge and heads up the digital mental health group at the MRC Cognition and Brain Science Unit at Cambridge University. Amy, you're very welcome. Um, we're very pleased to have you here for your presentation. I know you've had a very busy schedule, so we appreciate very much that you're with us and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, Amy will speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes and then I'll go to your audience for questions and answers. And you can join us uh, the discussion by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to send in comments, questions, observation during Amy's presentation. And I'd very much appreciate if you could you give your name and designation when you send in your, either your comments or your questions. I'll get back to you once uh, Dr. Orban has finished her presentation. Please feel free to join us on X using the handle at IIEA. And a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. Dr. Orban's presentation today is very timely. There has been widespread discussion on the media about the use of digital technologies among adolescents and its impact on their mental health. Many parents and indeed policymakers are worried about how children's, young people's mental health is being affected by these technologies. Dr. Orban has studied the impact of digital technologies on mental health of adolescents. And Amy, you've said, I think very clearly uh, in, in some of your papers, great claims require great evidence and great evidence has yet, yet been found. And I think that underpins a lot of the focus of our work, which is on the understanding of the nuanced relationship between digital technology use and mental health outcomes, challenging simplistic narratives and highlighting the need for evidence-based policy making. Amy's work encourages a balanced and informed approach to understanding digital technologies and mental health, steering away from fear-driven narratives and towards constructive research-backed solutions. Amy will reflect on these challenges and problems facing research in this area and provide an overview of her team's work in addressing these challenges to produce evidence that can be used to improve our understanding of adolescents' mental health in this area. Dr. Orban is a UK ORI Future Leaders Fellow at the MRC Cognition and Brain Science Unit and Fellow of St. John's College at Cambridge. She completed her PhD at University of Oxford and her MA at Cambridge and directs an internationally recognised research programme uh, investigating, as I said, the links between mental health and digital technology use in adolescents. She advises health officials and public servants around the world. I think it's a really interesting example of that link between research and policy making. Her work is supported by a range of key national and international funders, charities and foundations. And Amy, you've received a numerous number of uh, prestigious awards. And I just mentioned too, the Medical Research Council Early, Early Career Impact Prize and the British Psychological Society Award for Outstanding Contribution to Doctoral Research. Amy, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Joyce, and, and for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to the next 20 minutes where I'll present um, a range of reflections on this space. Um, I don't normally do a bit to introduce myself, but that was already so wonderfully done. Um, I and my team here at Cambridge, we lead one of the major centers of evidence provision in how social media and digital environments impact young people. And 
our evidence has fed into policy documents from all the way from the European Commission to the US Surgeon General and, for example, our current Supreme Court documents for um, litigation against technology companies. So a whole spectrum. And I routinely work, for example, in the UK with the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology and the Department for Education and providing advice on technology policy. Um, I My talk today will focus on why it's so difficult to understand how social media impacts young people's mental health, how I think we can start to build a better picture in this complex space that will also hopefully help us improve our policy making. And at the very end, I'll do some reflections on how I, where I see the real knotty issues um, that both policymakers, regulators, companies, and researchers will have to address together. So the talk will probably get a bit more unstructured as we go on when it becomes more reflective. I won't have slides today, but I did, um, I think it should be shared with you in the chat. I will reference about, well, 10 major pieces of work, and I'll let you know when I am talking about each one of them. So if you do want to look something up, you can just open the paper on the Google Drive link. So that will hopefully allow you to dig deeper on certain things I've talked about while allowing us to cover quite a lot of ground in 20 minutes. So as I said in the introduction, my talk today will be about the real complexity in this space. Digital life and social media are now intertwined with what, is, what it is to grow up in our society. Researchers say we're in a post-digital age where you can't differentiate anymore about what is digital and what is not digital. Everything is intertwined. And so we shouldn't be surprised that the impact of technologies that range from looking at educational materials on YouTube to being able to message your mom on the way home to being, being able to access self-harm content on, for example, Instagram, that if we look at that all together, the impact will likely be complex and vary across young people, across different parts of the population, but also vary, you know, in, in the same person over time. How one piece of content impacts you might differ from a day-to-day -day basis. For example, if you see your friend got married and there was a really nice picture uploaded to Facebook, for example, that might impact you differently if if you're in a really happy relationship or if you're just going through a commercial crisis. So um, I think we all can understand these complexities from our own day-to-day -day life. So I really wish there would be easy answers about the digital world. I think we would be a lot further in terms of our approach to it. But any narrative that has simple answers to how the digital world impacts young people is glossing over some very deep complexities. And I'll spend a couple of minutes highlighting some of these areas of contention. So for example, one of the key pieces of evidence that is used to say that social media is, is harming the general population of adolescents is that for the last 10 to 20 years, the well-being of adolescents has decreased or the mental health symptomatology has increased in parallel almost to the rise of internet use or social media use in the same population. So there are some really nice graphs where you really see those lines go up in parallel. They almost seem linked. However, for most of us in our, our school level science curricula would have learned that those lines are correlations. We don't yet know how they link together. And also, they're often a very specific snapshot of what is happening around the world. So in the first citation in, in the Google Drive, um, there's been some really large scale work that has shown on a global level, well-being levels actually haven't all decreased in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, if we would have kind of seen digitalization as a massive negative force, we would have expected that across countries, but it's mainly been in the US and in the Anglosphere where we have seen those decreases, even in some countries in the European Union, those decreases haven't shown up as prominently as some of the, for example, US or UK data. 
Further, there have been large scale analyses of internet access um, and in on a country level and how that's linked to well-being changes. And again, there's been a lot of mixed evidence there. That's also shown in that paper. Um, that could be because internet access also allows us to do loads of many great things. And I work with a lot of philanthropies and foundations that are actively rolling out internet in some of the most deprived areas of our world. Um, but I think it already com adds complexity to that argument that just because of these two lines going in the same direction, we're in some sort of crisis that we need to actively intervene on. I think it should cause us a pause for thought um, to think about what those trends actually mean and, and how robust they are on a national or international scale. There have been arguments that technology is rewiring our brains. Um, and on some way, we do recognize that technologies are used to grab our attention and that attention is monetized. So they will be designed in ways that will make them easy to use for long periods of time. I'm not going to dispute that. And we have active research taking models from addiction and the habit literature and psychology and applying it to technology data. However, there hasn't been any good evidence, for example, that screen use is sort of changing the brains of young people. We have seen isolated studies, but they've all again been correlational. So the brains of those who use screens look different or slightly different than the brains that don't use as many screens. However, screen use correlates with a huge number of other variables. For example, in the US context, there's a clear correlation between the amount of screen use and socioeconomic status or household income. The poorest children use more screens. And so there are a the host of other factors that could explain the differences in brain structures that have been found. Further, the second citation in the drive shows that on one of the largest scale investigations on thousands of young people, there wasn't actually a clear relationship between screen time and, and any changes in the functional way your brain works. So that's incredibly a very shaky area of evidence um, that will need to be investigated further for a long time. Some I, Another important thing to recognize is, as I said in the introduction, the impact of screens will differ largely across people. And um, there has been really good evidence showing that, which is also citation three in the drive. There has been, while tracking young people's mood and mental health over a period of a couple of weeks and looking at what how much social media they were using, researchers in the Netherlands found that while there was some proportion of young people that showed harms, there were others where they didn't show any impact and others showed a positive impact and they were quite equally spread. So if we're talking about harms, we might need to find those populations that are especially vulnerable while, and our policy approaches might be, need to be targeted to them while also recognizing that there'll be some young people who really benefit from online environments and our policy approaches need to appropriately allow them to still benefit from those. I think that's a really knotty issue. I further wanted to talk a bit about smartphone bans. I've been involved in those um, evidence provision here in the UK with the Department for Education. Um, actually now we're, we're waiting for um, the general election, but the evidence for smartphone bans in schools is still slightly mixed as well. So while I think you know, many of us would agree that smartphones in classrooms can be a real distraction and there needs to be rule setting and enforcement around that. There are reviews as shown in um, the fourth document in the drive that um, show that there's still quite inconclusive evidence in actual trials that have gone into the field. And that could be difficulties in the practicalities as well as in um, that phones are used for many different things and that a lot of schools already have rules around this. Lastly, I wanted to highlight the citation five in the drive, which are the latest results of the Pew Research Survey in the US that, that does large scale questionnaire data collection on young people aged 13 to 17. And I think while it's purely descriptive, it isn't really relating things over time or making any causal claims, they ask really interesting questions from their young people. 
And they asked them about social media use and smartphone use. And 64% of the US kind of young adolescent population said that they feel like they use social media the right amount, while about 27% said they use social media too much. So about two thirds feel like they, they got the balance right and a third says that they, they're, they don't. And so I think we need to understand that as well as that 70% of young people say they have more benefits than harms of being on social media and that they especially like it, its ability to, for them to be creative and for them to explore their interests and their hobbies. And that has really come out in some qualitative work as well, which is showing especially young people from minority groups, for example, those in very rural locations, do see the digital world as a place for them to connect with other people that they might not be able to connect with at school. And we need to recognize that this digital ecosystem has really changed a lot of facets of children's and young people's lives. And in some ways, there will be parts that are harmful and there will be parts of the population that are going to be harmed and some to an extreme extent. But for others, they see technology as a crucial place for self-expression, for exploration. And here at Cambridge, I see a lot of very talented young people from deprived backgrounds who've used digital tools and education material, for example, to teach themselves full curriculum <laughs> um, and, and really um, shine at academic interviews on mainly things they've learned off YouTube. So I think we need to understand that as a broad ecosystem. So why is there such mixed evidence? I think we all recognize that the digital environment, there will be things that are harmful and things that are beneficial, but why do we know so little about what those are and what those populations are that are at risk? Um, I think there are two main reasons that we need to recognize. The first is that the digital environment in research has been measured extremely badly. So most work focuses on screen time. And it's really quite obvious to all of us why time spent on a specific app or on your smartphone will probably not relate very directly to how you're feeling. It might depend on what you're doing, on what you're experiencing, on what content you're seeing. And at the moment, that part of research is almost impossible to do because we are largely closed out of all the data sources that um, digital companies are collecting um, about their users. And often we are left with having to ask users about what they're doing and how much they're doing um, of whatever activity we're interested in. And I think that that has really held back that evidence provision and is something that naturally in, in the EU, um, has started to be targeted, but is a problem that hasn't been solved. So I have some very, very talented colleagues who are epidemiologists who say that they're really not surprised that all the evidence is mixed and inconclusive because we're measuring something that is inherently noisy and probably not even aligned with what we want to measure because um, we might not want to measure screen time. And if we do measure screen time, people are really bad at estimating how much they use their phones. So you're kind of looking at people's self, very noisy self-estimation of how much they use social media, for example. Further, the second reason why evidence is mixed is that there are, we're talking about very complex outcomes. Mental health is hugely complicated. And if you start delving into that, that's whole areas of research and that might be different to well-being, which is a sort of flourishing or with educational outcomes. These are all very different and they're often lumped together. But how social media impacts a young person who's depressed might be very different to a young person who has an eating disorder or somebody who has ADHD or autism. And there has been no work trying to decipher those. One of my clinical psychology colleagues recently used quite an apt metaphor for this, where he said, well, you know, the digital world is now so complex and such a big part of young people's lives, asking whether, you know, 
online environments cause harm is similar to asking whether families cause harm because families are also complex and they can differ from child to child. They can differ over time. And we can all think of instances where families can cause grave harm, but also instances where families can be a lifeline. Um, and we wouldn't expect researchers to be able to tell us, you know, in one number or one tagline, what the impact of families are on young people. And I think we need to move to a similar conversation about digital technologies. So what do we do? <laughs> and it's some, how do we go further in this space? I think at least what my team has started to focus on is that we were inspired by all the medics that work around us in our institute, who to, for example, find a cure or a treatment for stroke victims or for people who are suffering from dementia, where they, to do so, they understand that they need to look underneath the hood and, and figure out exactly what the processes are that are leading to that disease or to that condition or to good recovery. So they need to understand what we would call the mechanisms. What are the wirings underneath the hood that, that is causing certain things to happen? Because once you understand the wiring and, and all the different things that are happening and why they're happening, you can start targeting specific interventions to specific parts of that system to help people without having to um, have a very generalist crude intervention. So most medicines are created in, in that way. So how do we do that for the digital world? Well, I think we need to split it up into its different active ingredients to then understand how those active ingredients impact young people. And that's exactly what has been done for many years in the communication science space. And I'll spend the next couple of minutes discussing um, more or less citation six in the Google Drive, which is if you read one paper, I would recommend reading that. It's a larger discussion of mine, a review of this whole space that sets out why this method is so important. Because what I argue is that the digital world has ways in which it really differs from the offline world. So if we focus on social media, social media, for example, quantifies social feedback um, by providing likes that, that can be quantified or follower accounts that can be quantified. Um, and in doing so, it changes the social fabric in a way that is testable. So how do likes um, that don't exist in the offline world impact young people. That might be a certain affordance or design feature of social media that we might want to study. Another one might be um, that social media allows online communic or communication in general to be available at all times. It used to be that you aren't always socially connected, especially beyond the school gates if you're a young person. And now you can just grab, go into your pocket and you're connected to other people. So that affordance of availability might be really important. There are other ones, for example, that social media allows you to curate your profile and, and who you display yourself to be, or that social media allows you to receive loads of social information um, through infinite scroll, where you're scrolling through loads and loads of material and consuming a lot of content. So by not thinking about social media as a monolith, but thinking about specific ways in which it changes our social world, we can get very testable things that, you know, we might want to understand how they are impacting young people. Because young people, um, or adolescence is a real time of mental health sensitivity. Um, about 50% of those people who will suffer from a mental health condition in their lifetime experience their first symptom before the age of 18. And so there are already ways in which we know that adolescence in those teenage years make us more sensitive to developing mental health conditions. And so we can start testing whether these differences in designs on social media or in the digital world might amplify that risk. So is the way that 
the online social world is designed, making young people even more at risk for, for example, developing a mental health condition. And we raise a couple of different ways in that that might well be happening. For example, young people um, on, on a behavioral level do more risky things. Adolescence is a time of risky behaviors, especially because young people want to fit in um, and they want to be included. And as part of that, they might drink or do um, more risky driving. And that has all been shown already. However, on social media, those risks could be amplified because there is a permanence about it. So instead of it being a transient thing, you you know, wear something that is slightly too revealing to a party, but people see it there, but then, you know, nobody sees it again. On social media, there could be evidence about that that could last for decades. Um, and so this affordance or design feature permanence in the online social world might amplify that, that risk for young people. Furthermore, there are changes to the brain and the mind that happen in adolescence. For example, we become a lot more sensitive to social inclusion. We really care about that we're included in our social group. And because social media makes things really quantified, for example, your friend getting 200 likes on a photo and you getting 20 might be a lot more um, impactful to your self-esteem than in the offline world where they might get quite a lot more compliments at school versus you maybe only got one or two, but it's not quantified, it's not on your screen, that differential in how popular you are or your friend's friend is. Further, um, young people are, they're, they're going through biological changes that, for example, make them more sensitive to stress. And so if social media increases stress levels, that might have a follow on impact as well. So we highlight at least, I think, 10 different, uh, different mechanisms that might be you know, changing mental health risk in young people. But we crucially also show that, um, for example, if you're an excluded adolescent in school and you don't find a good friendship group, social media might actually decrease that risk by allowing you to contact others um, or if you're in a difficult situation with your family and it's a risky situation, I have heard of young people sort of Skyping their friends overnight um, or, or FaceTiming them. And so technology might be a real help for you as well. So it, it's not just that it's all negative, um, but we need to understand those mechanisms to um, understand how specifically the digital environment might be impacting young people to then, once we know that, be able to target, for example, design recommendations or regulation specifically to those mechanisms to safeguard them. And this is already being done in a, in a broad way um, in a couple of different spheres that I will cover quite quickly so that I can get to the reflection part of the talk. So firstly, there have been safety by design principles established so that we know that the digital world is often not designed with children in mind and there are really great design principles being developed, for example, by the Five Rights Foundation in London uh, that have design recommendations to make the digital world safer developmentally for young people. So they're already taking a design-based approach to that question. Further, there's been some really interesting work on interventions that I put in the drive in Citation 7, where researchers at the University of Oxford have developed um, an intervention for university students where they can, on a browser, there are extensions you can download that can manipulate your social media experience. For example, there's an extension that you can download that um, makes the Facebook newsfeed go away, or that makes YouTube recommendations go away. And they found that in this multi-week training session where they allow young people to explore these mixed impacts of social media on their mood and their attention, and then allow them to self-experiment with some of these different interventions, 
they they have seen really positive initial results. So what they argue for is that we need a digital world that where people can customize their experience. Um, and I'm very happy to answer questions about that. Again, that's really focusing not on the platform as a whole or the phone as a whole, but on every individual is different and how can we empower them to design a digital space that is safe and healthy for them and that allows them to get to their goals. This has also been applied to parenting, which is the eighth citation in the drive, where in quite large scale research, um, researchers found that parents that use very restrictive parenting techniques often have, there's more negative outcomes. So kids get rebellious um, and they decide to not do what the parent tells them to do. And they found that the most effective digital parenting techniques foster autonomy in the child and have a discursive approach to um, understand how this technology impacts them and to um, together decide how best to use that technology in the home. And um, if you're interested, do have a look at citation eight. I thought it was a really interesting read. So some of you might, and a lot of parents that come to my talks feel exasperated. You, there's a need and, and there's a widely recognized need that the digital world at the moment isn't working for everyone. That's something that's designed with profit in mind, shouldn't be our social infrastructure and that there are real problems. And so any person saying, well, the evidence is not completely there is seen as somebody holding back important progress. And this is a really difficult space to be as a researcher. And it's something I've reflected a lot about because as I said, the digital world is so complex and mental health is so complex and there are so many individual differences that we, we shouldn't be surprised that at the moment providing evidence takes a huge amount of time, especially because research is under-resourced and we don't get access to the levels of data we need from companies. However, we also all want a safe digital environment for kids. So how can we, what can we do about this? So the first thing that we might want to do is speed up how quickly evidence is provided. And um, I'd love to do that. I'd love to be able to pump out the evidence that is needed at the time that it's needed for people. To do so, we might invest in a couple of different things. The first is that we shouldn't be collecting data about technologies that concern us now and often i find i get funded you know i get funded to do work on social media now by government but actually what i should be doing is collecting data about ai and children and young people so that in four or five years time when the concerns are you know flaring up about that that will have longitudinal good data about that <laughs> and so we need prospective data collection about new technologies when they come on the market start tracking how young people use them, how young people are impacted by them, and to develop a real evidence generation machinery around us that isn't funded by sort of short-term grants um, or by people saying, oh, now we're concerned about X, so now provide us with the evidence when that should have been done five years ago so that we'll have the good longitudinal evidence available. And there are, for example, people in the UK that are increasingly um, charities and, and stakeholders in the online safety space that argue that this might be funded, for example, by a levy or through other governmental means. Further, because data is so critical, data access is critical. And the EU has done great work on the Digital Services Act and starting to try to empower researchers to access digital company data to answer societally critical research questions. However, I think the proof will be in the pudding over the next few years about how that actually works. Um, and there'll be a lot of learning that we can take from that, hopefully. There are other mechanisms as well that allow us to access data. For example, under GDPR, everybody has the right to access data that digital companies store on themselves. And I think we could improve the ways in which that data could be donated to research. 
because there are participants in my department coming in every day and donating their time to research or donating their brain scan to research or their blood, but it's very difficult for them to donate their digital data. I think that could be made easier. Uh, it's quite easy win. I think there needs to be more work with companies um, and real work and collaboration from the very beginning. Because at the moment, a lot of bridges have been burnt, especially in the policy and the company space, which makes it very difficult to collaborate on a researcher level without getting conflicts of interest. Um, but they also need to be open to collaborating with a broad range of researchers and not handpicking those that seem most aligned um, with maybe what what sort of results are, are needed. I, I don't want to say that's happening, but um, there is often a selection on certain teams that get company data and certain teams that don't. So I think we really need to think about how we provide evidence quicker, not for the social media debate, but for the debates that are coming down the line. Concerns about new technologies aren't new. They've been happening on a sort of 10, 20 year cycle, you know, throughout the decades, which you can see in citation nine. Um, but technology is accelerating. And so we need to get better at providing that evidence quicker in a time that is needed for proper um, recommendations, regulation, design changes, et cetera. I want to, I'll spend the last four minutes and then I'll, I'll go over to questions, reflecting on, well, what if we can't speed up evidence quickly enough? And I think it's a really big ask. It will need funding and support from not just academia, but across the political, governmental and stakeholder space to be able to provide evidence at that speed that technology is now developing at. So I think we need to ask ourselves very seriously how we hold technology development to account in a space where science is still very slow. It's you know funded to a fraction of the amount that the scientific teams and the companies are funded at. So what should we do? In citation 10 in the drive, I put in a philosophy of science paper about fast science which is a reflection of a colleague of mine at Cambridge about the COVID-19 pandemic or other crises in history where researchers, because of the time pressure of having to react quickly, have decided to do quote unquote fast science to lower their evidentiary thresholds. So to say, I now need less evidence that I normally need, for example, to say that social media is causing a mental health crisis because the the risk of me waiting another five years to get better evidence is actually, you know, it might cause more harm than me endorsing that hypothesis now. I think there is a space where we might say, actually, we need to lower certain evidence thresholds in this space. You know, even mixed evidence that is slightly negative might be enough to do something. And we should maybe toy with that idea, but, Jacob in this paper really highlights that if we do that, there are risks and we need to put a lot of safeguards in place. And one of the main safeguards he talks about is that fast science is split into two phases. The first is to understand how big the crisis is. What is the risk? What do we need to do? You know, at what scale does our policy intervention need to be? Do we need to shut the country down or you know, do we just need to fund more hospitals, <laughs> for example, in the, the COVID pandemic? And then the second phase is, is figuring out what to do, choosing our intervention. And he says that if we do fast signs, for example, for the first stage, so saying that there is a risk and that we should do something, we should be extra careful for the second stage. That means providing really good evidence on the interventions that we plan to put into the field. And I think that's where current discussions also fall down in the social media space. A lot of those people who want quite heavy restrictions on social media use for young people that are largely unevidenced um, say that this is because there's a crisis and there's a real need to do something. But they often also agree that what we did during COVID, for example, shutting schools might not have been good either. And I find it very interesting that 
they use very similar thought patterns where they say there's a crisis and this is the solution, but that solution actually hasn't been tested on a large scale. So my call in, in that space might be that we need to properly test interventions. We should be funding work that looks at the impact of school closure, maybe on a randomized scale in, in a district, in a, in a certain school district or I meant smartphone bans if I didn't say that, um, or we should be testing whether locking your phone in a drawer at night actually helps young people. So actually starting to test those interventions properly. And so I think we need to both speed up, there's probably my solution is a mixture of the two. We need to speed up evidence provision. We need to properly resource that. But we also need to understand that evidence provision will inherently be slow and that we might need to test out potential interventions quickly in the field, in certain districts or schools to understand whether um, certain technologies or certain changes might actually help young people, maybe before we have the perfect evidence of what the harm or the benefit is as well. But I'm happy to discuss that in the questions. So um, thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to hearing um, what you have to say. This podcast is brought to you by the IIEA, sharing ideas, shaping policy.